Good morning, I'm Katie Cottingham and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Mary Kirchhoff from the American Chemical Society and Dr. Mark Ratner from Northwestern University. They will be talking to us about National Academy's report on effective chemistry communication. First we'll start with Dr. Ratner. The National Academies do many things. One of the things that they do is studies of various parts of American and world society. These are always in response to a request from an organization, usually in the government, but not always. And there are many, many of these reports, about 300 a year. The one on effective communication in chemistry in informal environments was the brainchild of a group of people who got together at the National Academies trying to understand the relationship between chemistry and the community. And generally, chemists are people who deal with molecules. They're people who deal with ideas that many Americans have real trouble grasping. And the idea of informal chemistry communication is to have people talk to people in large events, in small events, in various places. But if you're going to do that, you need to be taught to do that, just like you need to be taught to ride a bicycle. And so the idea was that we will put together a large number of people from many, many places, and we would request from an independent agency some ideas. Two of those agencies came up with ideas. And then we've had four meetings in Washington trying to produce a guide we actually produced two guides. There's a big guide, and there's a little guide. <laughs> the big guide gives you all the background, all the data, all the citations, and everything that should be in a National Academy report. The small one, which is unique to this particular document, I've, I've been on many of these, and I've never seen one before that came out with a small guide. The small guide is for the person who's going to communicate chemistry. So suppose this person is a scoutmaster, and he's talking to the scouts and their parents. Suppose this person is somebody who works in a chemical company, and he's being asked to talk about what he does. Or, or suppose she was working for a drug firm. What, what chemistry does that involve? Or even what chemistry is involved in trying to keep the streets clean and making ice go away so you don't fall down in the wintertime. And all of these things relate to chemistry. Chemistry is generally thought about by the population as a slightly scary subject, right? There are, there are oil spills and there are chemical leakages and there are all those things. And part of that needs to be understood. And that has always been the problem. It continues to be the problem. And what we hope is that these two guides will help the community who is interested in chemistry communicate much better with the American people. Okay, Dr. Kirchhoff? Yes. Thank you. Um, the report, uh, as Mark pointed out, is unique in that the pr practitioner's guide is really designed to assist those who are going out to communicate chemistry in different environments in a very structured way, just things to think about. Um, the report comes up with five different elements that uh, a chemist should consider when planning to do some sort of a communication activity. And this can be things such as, you know, very um, well-established activities such as National Chemistry Week, it could be a science cafe, uh, it could be speaking to your local Kiwanis Club. And many chemists are very enthusiastic about going out and communicating their science with the public or, or, or with children outside of formal school settings. Um, and yet, again, as Mark mentioned, we haven't been trained to do this. So what's exciting about this report is that it, it looked at the research on, on chemistry education, on science communication, and on informal education, and really synthesized that into sort of a best practice guide 
for conducting communication activities. Um, I certainly anticipate being someone who, who works at the American Chemical Society that this is a, a document that's going to be extremely useful to our, our student chapters, our high school chemistry clubs, our local sections who go out and do a lot of hands-on activities, a lot of things like science cafes, and this should really bring some, some very thoughtful structure and help chemists identify how they can be most effective in conveying their science to the general public. Public. So it's just a tremendous resource that we think is going to have a very significant impact on chemistry communication. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have questions? Just remember to state your name and affiliation when you're asking the question. Kath? So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, I guess the mere publication of a report like this implies that maybe people are getting it wrong somehow in the way that they're communicating chemistry. Um, what are the problems that um, you think the, the most common uh, shortfalls that, that people have in, in communicating um, about science? I think the, the hardest thing for people is chemicals. I mean, water is a chemical. Fruit juice is a chemical. Butter toast is a chemical. But people don't think of them as chemicals. People think of chemicals as being things that are bad, right? Things that pollute water, things that cause pain, things that could be dangerous or explosive. And the, the understanding of, of how the molecular world works, because chemists deal with the molecular world, that's a very challenging thing to do. And many, many, many people have tried to do this over many, many years. This is an attempt to give them some help. So suppose you're living in Richmond, Virginia, and you're working for the town. You're, you're an inspector. You know, you're supposed to be inspecting the roads and you're inspecting all the communications capabilities and things like that. And there's a lot of chemistry involved there, right? And that chemistry needs to be conveyed to people. They need to understand that much of what goes on is at the level of chemicals, of molecules. And that communication is difficult because most people have not taken chemistry classes in college, and they don't really understand the difference between a nice chemical and a bad chemical, and they don't understand really what chemicals are. So we have a, lot, a difficult road to hoe, and the only way to do it is by informal communication. And it doesn't really do any good for somebody like me to get up and talk into a microphone and yeah, everybody will go to sleep, right? But if you have a meeting with the people that you know, if, if you go into a club, if you go into a restaurant, if you just get together at a Kiwanis meeting or something like that, that's the informal part. And that's what we were really going after in this report. So could you just say some of the key points that, that you've, um, perhaps in the simplified report, what are the sort of key points, messages that you're telling people um, how to actually communicate informally? You, we've got, um, and, and I want to go back to your previous question too, we're certainly not suggesting that what people have been doing is, is wrong. What we're just trying to do is provide some more structure and things to think about. So for example, the, you know, the first one is really to uh, know your audience. Um, how can you find out who your audience is? You, you don't want to be pitching it at the, you know, a level of somebody who's, uh, you know, got a PhD if your audience is a bunch of high school students. Um, so you have to really think about who the audience is. You have to think about your resources. You know, what's available to you? Um, what kind of space are you going to be in? You know, safety considerations, always very important with chemistry. Um, you need to think about... Um, the uh, assessment piece. Now that's one that we actually wrestled a lot with on the uh, committee um, because the, the whole concept of evaluation can sort of put people off. You know, I'm just going to go out and give a talk. You know, what, why do I have to do evaluation? But evaluation needs to be scaled to the actual activity. So if it's a one-time thing like a science cafe, evaluation can be as simple as asking for a show of hands on questions or having people fill out a two-question questionnaire at the end. Um, so it doesn't have to be extensive, but if it's a longer-term informal engagement activity, say it's something that's ongoing in a museum or maybe it's an after-school program that you're going to be seeing a group of children in a boys and girls club for weeks, you want to do more uh, formal and ex extensive assessment 
placement on that. Um, and then during the activity itself, you want to make sure you're sort of following your plan, that you're communicating it well, and t making mid-course corrections if necessary. I mean, we've all had the experience. I, you know, as a former faculty member, you, you look at your students and you know they're not understanding. And so you've got to change direction at that point and figure out how to really convey the information that you're trying to, to share with your audience. And then finally, uh, after your um, activity, you want to make sure you sort of reflect on it, see how it went, what could be done differently so that you can improve it the next time, and then share your results with the community because uh, we all benefit from learning what works and what doesn't work from other people's experiences. Anything I left out, Mark? Just the simple framework. So this is the little book, and there's just one page that's kind of important. That's the framework, and there are five components. First, you have to set your goals. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to help people understand things? Do you want to present things? Do you want an interaction? What's the nature of the communication that you're going to be doing? The second one is to familiarize yourself with your participants. Who are the people that you're talking to? Is it a Boy Scout group? Is it a club? Is it, as I did about three weeks ago, a woman's club? And you need to know that because that's going to be very important. Then you have to design the actual activity. Is it going to be a talk? Is it going to be a demonstration? Is it going to be a round table? Is it going to be a discussion group? Finally, you have to really do it. You have to do the communicating. And then, most importantly, and Mary stressed this, most importantly, you have to think and evaluate. Is this what I wanted to do? Did this work? Did this not work? So that you can change it for the next time that it comes around. Now, that all sounds very simple. But it's very important because I've done a lot of this and I know a lot of people who have. And there's really no guide out there for how to do this. And we think that this is the first one that's come out and sort of done it in pretty simple language. Okay. Um, so who, who um, how is this going to get out to people? How can people get hold of copies? And also who was involved in actually um, compiling the report? Mm -hmm. So dissemination, um, press conference, um, but the report itself is freely available on the Academy's website. Um, hard copies will be available uh, shortly. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And um, certainly within ACS, um, we plan to disseminate this report to all of our groups who do uh, out outreach activities, who do communication activities, again, our local sections, our student chapters, our high school chemistry clubs, to make sure that they are aware of this guide and can use it in planning their activities to communicate chemistry with the public. Okay, question in the back. We have an online question from Andrea Widener of Chemical and Engineering News, and she asks, why did chemistry in particular need this guide as opposed to other sciences? I think it goes back to what I said before. You know, when people start thinking about chemistry, most folks think about bad stuff. They think about leakages, they think what happened in Toledo, they think about explosions, they think about toxics, and chemistry doesn't enjoy a nice reputation like medicine does. And we need to kind of break down that barrier. And that, that's the reason that this is specific to chemistry. I mean, I have a friend who worked on one for the general for informal communication of sciences, all sciences. But chemistry has a unique set of issues that people are afraid of, probably. I think that's the first thing to say. And we're trying to stop that. We're trying to make it as clear and open as possible. And, you know, in an area like biology or astronomy, for example, People love astronomy, they love hearing about the planets. Nothing's gonna hurt them from the planets, right? They're not gonna find something from the planets in their coffee that's gonna make them sick. That's it. Yeah. And even though this is specific to chemistry, um, we, we certainly believe that the framework that's been developed and the five elements are applicable to the other sciences and to other communication activities. So, uh, you know, as Mark mentioned, there are some unique aspects to chemistry, um, but the, the, the whole approach should be applicable to biology, to physics, to astronomy. Okay. <clears throat> Doug? 
Doug Dallimore, ACS Office of Public Affairs. Um, as a science communicator who um, works with uh, students uh, quite a bit, chemistry students, um, helping them try to communicate with the public, one of the things that that I try to get across to them is that uh, try to focus on the why of what you're doing rather than the how, at least in the beginning when you're first starting out. Is is that something that is considered in the report? So that, so that you know, you talk about what's the benefit for the person, what's why chemistry is good rather than diving into the how, which is so loaded with jargon and right. that right. fear that you're talking about. Right, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it could be something as simple as fertilizers for the garden, right? There are nice fertilizers and then there's some that you really have to, have to be quite careful about. And that's, that's not something that people normally think of as chemical, but it is chemical. And there are different ways to evaluate that, different ways to think about it. So chemistry is there everywhere, right? It's there in the water, it's there in what you breathe, it's there in what you wear, it's there in what you walk on. And I think you sound like a pro. And you know, most of us who've been doing this for a long time really needed something like this, just to evaluate ourselves. Are we communicating in a proper way? And generally, we preach. And that's fine for preachers, but it's not really good for chemists. We shouldn't be preaching. We should be communicating. And that means back and forth and back and forth. And that's what part of this, mm -hmm. this thing is. Yes, it is a conversation. It's a, it's a very exactly. casual conversation. And that's something that chemists have to, to learn to do. One of the things that I, uh, I talk about with the folks that I work with is that if you think about it, a lot of hit songs, rock songs, have their roots in classical music. Yes. I Can't Help Falling in Love with You by Elvis Presley was actually originally an aria for an opera in the 1880s. If you think about the melody of that as a, as a metaphor, you can say, oh, the, 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 the chemist is usually talking in the aria language, but the people really, latch on to the, the Elvis Presley tune. Yes. So you have to vary, yeah. and that's coming back to knowing your audience. Yeah. Okay, and one last question. Um, who was involved in putting this report together? Like, uh, were there just professors getting together and discussing no. this, or? Yeah, so who was involved? Where is the expert here? <laughs> I'm, I'm the expert on this. So in, involved in this, uh, so Mark uh, was uh, co-chair with uh, Dave Uko from uh, Museums and More. So we did have chemistry faculty um, who were engaged in uh, uh, outreach, we did have uh, chemical educators, there were science communicators, so there was a wide range of expertise and of course the, the fabulous staff at the National Academies who did a wonderful job in, in bringing this report to fruition and, and making sure we stayed true to our task. And we did employ two firms to make some studies for us, which were very helpful, and we had some people whose job it did well basically academics who specialize in communications right. rather than just chemistry. Okay. Great, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at 9.30 on 3D printing cartilage to fix damaged knees, noses, and ears. Thank you. Thank you.